uh, we were scrambled off, and we were told that two Russian uh, Su-19 or Su-22 fitters had crossed over the border and were flying low level somewhere near the Gütersloh area. And this German controller was really excited, and he was he was screaming on the radio and he was shouting. His voice was very high pitched. You know, there are two targets and they're heading west. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Ian Black is a former Royal Air Force fighter pilot with a passion for photography and motorcycles. He began his flying career with the legendary McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom in RAF Germany at the height of the Cold War. After three years flying as a navigator, Ian underwent pilot training in 1984 to 1986, during which time he was awarded prizes for flying ability, aerobatics and unsurprisingly navigation skills. On completion of his flying training, Ian was selected to fly the English Electric Lightning in the air defence role. 25 years earlier, Ian's father had been one of the RAF's first lightning pilots and his son was set to become the last, serving on 11 F Squadron. Now, I really need your help to allow me the time to continue producing and preserving these Cold War stories. A monthly donation to help keep us on the air is only about $4, £3 or €3 Euros a month, although larger amounts are welcome too. Plus you get that sought after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a monthly financial supporter and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. So, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Ian Black to our Cold War conversation. Was it always your intention to become a an RAF pilot as a child? I, yes, I guess like everyone has a dream and everyone you know, sets their, their goal very high. I was always conscious of the fact that you know, perhaps I couldn't do it. And somebody the other day said to me, there's a thing called imposter syndrome where you do something and you just can't quite believe in yourself that you're doing either doing what you're doing or you can do what you do. And it took me a long time, probably longer than most people, to suddenly realise that, yeah, you know, whatever you want to do in life, you can achieve it. And it just requires a bit of hard graft and a bit of effort. When I joined the Air Force, one of the things I wanted to do, because I didn't have that confidence of thinking that I could become a, a single seat fighter pilot, was I was interested in photography then. And I actually wanted to join um, as a photographic interpreter, because I knew that was a way to get um, into Bricksmiths. And as a child of sort of 14 or 15, my father had been the base commander in a German base at Wildenhof. And we'd gone up to Berlin uh, one weekend or for a week, you know, for the family holiday. And we stayed with the British ambassador. And I remember as a 14-year-old sitting there in my short, and my father and the British ambassador, or the air attaché, I think it was my air attaché, they were talking about Bricksmiths, thinking that I didn't know anything about it. And they were talking about having just seen the latest fish bed or something and this guy taking photographs. And I sort of asked my father, and he said, well, you shouldn't have been listening to that conversation. And then, you know, because I know he'd been in BI6, I said, oh, I quite fancy, you know, joining the Air Force and becoming, you know, photographic interpreter and, and going to Bricksmith. And he said, no, 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 you're, you're not going to do that. You know, you're, you're going to become a pilot. You know, that's, I'm not having a son of mine being a photographer. But clearly, you know, flying a lightning does require some sort of natural ability and skill. But... Most of the, you know, what goes with flying an interceptor is, is just hard work and, and having that sort of ability to do it. So eventually I thought, yeah, no, why not? You know, if I want to become a lightning pilot, that's what I'll set my goal. I'll, I'll try and get that, that um, you know, goal in the end to, to be successful. 
in- interestingly, when you joined the Royal Air Force, you didn't join as a as a pilot first of all. You were a navigator. I I always had that dream that what I wanted to do was to fly the Lightning and to be uh, an air defence pilot. And because I had that self doubt, I thought, well, I'd rather than join and fail. I'll go and join the army and spend three years in the army and go to Sandhurst and just become make a man of myself. And after about three months, I thought, no, this is not what I want to do. I applied to join the Air Force. And they said, well, the only places we have at the moment is being as a navigator. And I was so despondent with being a, an infantry soldier. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go and be a navigator. And that's how I ended up being a navigator. Right, right. So th- this was the early 1980s. What was the, the training like for a navigator in the Royal Air Force then? Um, it was pretty, I wouldn't say the word primitive, but it was pretty unsuited to the task. So air defense navigators in the RAF were a fairly rare breed. There was only the Phantom that had a navigator in the back, and the only other fast jet navigators were Buccaneer navigators. And then they had that um, sort of in-between Vulcan navigators and Canberra navigators. So you had to go through the whole process of being a um, should we say, a pure navigator before you were then selected to becoming uh, either a fast jet navigator or a, a transport navigator. And then when you became a, uh, a fast jet navigator, there was nothing um, set up that you could operate a radar or a weapon system or any form of navigation equipment. So all you did was fly in a jet provost, look out the window with a map and a stopwatch and do a bit of tail chasing, a bit of low-level navigation. So it, was, it wasn't really tailored to what the, the final job was going to be. And, and that style of navigation is, is virtually unchanged since the Royal Air Force in World War II, I guess. It, totally. And, you know, we flew with, um, once you'd done the, the basic training on the Domini and you were then streamed, to go fast yeah it's called group one that's what it was called it was you were the group one which meant you were fast jet which and that could encompass the canberra or the vulcan or you were group two and that was going to transports or the nimrod so if you went group one um you would then stream in a different way and as with everything in training when you you got to a certain phase of the course say maybe after six to eight months there was this big you know cloud over your head thinking am I going to go group one? Am I going to go group two? And it's fine if you want to go to transports and you know wear your short sleeve shirts and go around the world. But if you didn't and you ended up that way, then it was a bit of a, a you know a bit of a long drop to suddenly think I'm not going to be a fast jet navigator. I'm now going to be a BC10 navigator or something. But once you were then selected for um, low level navigation or fast jet navigation, you either flew the Domini and used the radar a bit there, and then you went to the Jet Provost. So there was it was sort of just a bit of a i think it's more of a lead-in to what you fly rather than actually training you to fly so it's a, it's almost checking your your ability yeah and i think as well it's a, a question as you alluded to there and that you know it's the old-fashioned techniques of flying an aircraft looking at a map looking at the stopwatch looking out the window that's never changed in fact it's only just changed now when you've got an ipad that does it for you but in those days, you know, it's just um, heading time and speed. That's all it was. And working out what the drift was, working out, you know, where you had to be, how fast you had to get to another target, and that sort of mental agility that they would give you, you know, maybe you'd have to go around some weather, and then they say, well, you've still got to make your target on time, so then how are you going to do that? How are you going to cut the corner off a leg and then make up five minutes or lose two minutes? And I guess thinking in a cockpit, um in that sort of three-dimensional environment was the way they tested how your ability was going to be. When you completed the, the training using those training aircraft, what, what was the procedure to then adapt you to be able to, you know, navigate with, in the backseat of a Phantom, for example? Well, I, I was reasonably lucky because although the Air Force had had hunters at tra- a tactical weapons unit for, for many years, the advent of the hawk was pretty much you know, one or two years they've had the hawk. And somebody had the bright idea, well, there were so many empty back seats, why not put navigators or trainee navigators in the back of the hawk at tactical weapons and pair them up with pilots or you know, junior pilots and let them get on with it, which we did. So I had about, I think, two months of sitting in the back of the hawk at Broadie, which was a godsend, really, because it meant that Every day I was putting a G suit on, I was getting into the back of a hawk, I was pulling 9G as it was then, 
I was going off and doing air combat. I was doing air to air gunnery. I was doing low level SAP simulated attack profiles. So by the time I arrived on the Phantom OCU, at least I'd had some exposure to you know fast jet flying, as it were, as opposed to a jet provost. But you, nothing nothing could train you for walking out to a Phantom on a line with the two cockpits open and the ladder and just climbing up that ladder and then looking into the back of a phantom cockpit and thinking, oh my goodness, I've, I've got to get in the back of this and I've got to, and I've got a job to do. I'm, you know, I'm looking for a passenger ride. Somebody's expecting me to navigate this phantom, get the pilot from A to B and also to get in behind, you know, a Russian bomber as it were in the day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the navigation aids that were in a, in a phantom, what, what were they at that point? We had a thing called the Inertial Navigation Attack System, which was a, a throwback and a leftover from when the Phantom was a ground attack aircraft. And that was, you know, state of the art at the time. And it involved spinning up gyros in warm bars of oil. And then these gyros would be processed and aligned. And depending on how much G you pulled, you, you could then maybe have an accuracy of maybe a mile. So after an hour's sortie, if you had your little pointer going back to, say, Coningsby or Watersham or whatever it was, it would at least take you back to within a mile of the airfield. But, you know, it depended what, you know, the sortie type you want to do. If you did air combat, sometimes they were a bit like the old black and white TV sets. Some were good, some were bad. Some required a bit of fettling. Some required a bit of updating. And as I said, it was more really for ground attack uh, phantoms and, and air defense phantoms all we wanted to do was basically get to where our cap position was and get ourselves home so we didn't use the full potential of it and then we had a TACAN and then as obviously as a navigator you had a map and a stopwatch and you were really you were the guy who was supposed to be keeping a 3D picture of where you were so if you went on an intercept and you were suddenly screaming off chasing a target at I don't know, 500 miles an hour on a heading of 060 you had to sort of have this sixth sense of knowing, well, we left, um, for an example, um, Flambrecht, 10 miles east of Flambrecht, you hit your stopwatch and then you'll eventually shoot this guy down and you're thinking, well, that was two and a half minutes away. We've been heading 060, we've been doing 600 knots. We've got to be 25 miles off the coast or something. You know, we, We've got to be that sort of distance and keeping this 3D air picture going. I, I just do find it incredible that, you know, the RAF of the 1980s was still using navigation techniques that the that the dam busters had been using. Yeah, the other thing which the INAS was was good at was that it was it was jam resistant. So the the whole of the navigation kit and the INAS was self contained in the aircraft. We didn't have to rely on the TACAN, you know, the tactical air navigation system, which could be meconned and turned on and turned off and break down. So. That was a good. The beauty of it is, you know, we couldn't be jammed by Soviet radars or anything. It was all all internal, and we would always know where we had to get back to. Yeah, yeah. So you you were posted to the Phantom in Germany, correct? Correct. I, originally, I was posted to Lucas, and my brother was a, a Phantom navigator. And he was a, a weapons instructor on the Phantom, and he'd done his first tour in Germany, and he said to me. You know, it's really good fun. He said, but if you really want to experience uh, what the true role of an air defense navigator is, he kindly said to me, you should go to Lucas because then you'll do QRA and you can do low level over Scotland. And the whole gambit of um, intercepts is far greater than it is in Germany. And he said, you know, go to Germany on your second tour and do that, which was a bit of a hospital pass, really, because you know, having been to Germany, I'm so glad that I went there and not to Lucas. Not that, you know, going to Lucas was bad, but the, the flying in Germany at the height of the Cold War was second to none. And so I was posted to 43 Squadron at Lucas, and I was really looking forward to it. And I was thinking, well, the only thing really that was going to be a bit of a downer was that being in the middle of Scotland, there was there were no females around. So it was going to be a fairly lonely time up there. And I'd just get on with it and maybe see, you know, a bear every couple of weeks and, and that would be good fun but sadly a guy uh in germany became ill i think and he died and they did a replacement you know within the next two weeks so i said well I, you know i'd quite happily go so I, I i swung around from going to scotland to germany in a heartbeat right right and what was the phantom's role in in germany 
So we were tasked with low-level air defense, and we were primarily, our, our role was to plug gaps in the, the Hawk Nike low-level missile belts. So when they were fired out or when there were gaps in the area where there was no coverage, we were supposed to plug the gaps to basically shoot down any Soviet fighter bombers that would come through. And it was all incredibly complicated because, as you can imagine, that had, had we gone to war, we would have been looking at a map and a compass and flying around intercepting uh, Russian MiG-23s and 27s floggers that looked very, very similar to Jaguars, trying to do this in amongst our own uh, rapier belts and Hawk and Nike belts and you know short-range air-to-air missiles and air-to-ground missiles, and it would have been absolute carnage. Yeah, yeah. So was there some form of IFF, identification friend or foe? No. Well, we we did have IFF, and so say the squat was 4657 or something, that did change every half an hour, and that was primarily for our own uh, rapier airfield defence to ensure that we didn't get shot down by them. But there was no way of interrogating in the Phantom. We couldn't interrogate uh, a target. So if we saw a target um, and we were heading east and the target was heading west towards our base and we locked it up, there was no way of telling that um, it was friendly or, or or a foe. So the only way that you could identify the target was visually. Now, there were, there were systems where we had lanes. So there would be certain traps where the Jaguars would track out on and then they would come back in what were known as safe lanes. So they would fly down those safe lanes. But as you can imagine, if you're in the back of a Phantom with your head looking at the radar, trying to work out whether this target was on a safe lane or not was impossible because, you know, you, you could have picked up a target that was 20 or 30 degrees right of the nose at 15 miles. And then you've got to back plot your position to where you are and then try and work out whether he's on a safe lane or not. And there was nothing in the aircraft that would show you that. So the only thing you could do was to get visual with him. And that meant in poor weather, you'd have to get within three or four miles of him to then identify him. Now, in peacetime, you'd probably look at a target and go, oh, that's that's definitely a Jaguar. And you press the trigger and you shoot him. But in wartime, nobody, and you know, I would defy anybody to say, yes, they could. Nobody would look at a target and five, four seconds later go, yep, that's a hostile target. I'll squeeze the trigger. You know, I would personally have been wanting to be 110% sure that what I was shooting at, you know, I'd want to see the white of the guy's eyes. I'd want to see that red star on the side and then squeeze the trigger. The last thing I'd ever want to do was squeeze the trigger and then suddenly find I'd shot a Jaguar down, as, as a Phantom ironically did. So you had to get a visual on the target. Now, from memory, the uh, Sparrow and the Skyflash missiles we had a a combat range of something like uh, five four five miles head on and a min range of something like two or three miles so the minimum range you could fire head on was around about two miles before the, the missile would fuse an arm so you were literally going to be going look visual yes hostile squeeze are you in min range and it was that sort of speed so you, there was no you know, deliberation or assessing or asking the guy in the back, do you think it's hostile, do you think it's friendly, shall we fire? You would have literally had to go, I'm tally, meaning it's a hostile with the aircraft. A couple of seconds later, yep, it's definitely hostile, squeeze the trigger, and then you're at min range, and then you can't fire. Incredible. Incredible. And also, at the same time, you're worried about being shot down yourself. So that's not the only thing you're thinking about. <laughs> no, the, and the, there would be a million things to think about because – your RWR, your radar warning receiver, was in the bottom right hand from memory, bottom right hand, or bottom, no, bottom left hand corner of the Phantom Copper. I can't remember exactly where it was. So if you were, say you were going against uh, at low level, a package of MiG 23s or 27s, they might be you know, uh, equipped with an airborne radar. So your RWR might be illuminated and you might be locked up, but then you might be trying to intercept him and, and you ought to be absolutely clear that when you try and intercept this guy you're not going to suddenly then stray into a shore ad zone uh, you know, run by a german nike site so you could suddenly find yourself going through hopson's um, airspace and into their airspace where they've got their own short-range air defense missiles and then you know you're not just 
fighting against the Russian MiG-23, you're then trying to avoid being shot down by a German or a Dutch airfield defense system. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the beauties was that we, every day, we would fly maybe an hour and a half from Wildenhof out and back, and we would know exactly where we were. So after about a year and a half, I could... Do, you know, without blowing my own trumpet, I could do an intercept onto whatever it was, an F-15 or an F-16 or an F-104, and I'd be sitting in the back, and I could be doing the intercept, and, and occasionally, in my peripheral vision, I'd see a, a chimney or a mast or a church spire go whizzing past my cockpit, and I'd know, okay, that's Erklands, or that's Huckelhoven, or that's Heinsberg, or that's somewhere, and I wouldn't have to look at the map, because I knew exactly where these places were, and the training areas where we're in, we used to clean in low areas and mountainous areas. You you would just be acclimatized to where these places were. So you could you get a rough feel of where you were. But of course, if you had in a wartime situation, you were chasing some target miles off where your normal track was, all of a sudden it was very easy to get lost and you know, you, you then all of a sudden went, Well, where the heck am I? And then you'd have to rely on your national navigation system to have a rough stab at where you were. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get uh, scrambled to in- intercept any unidentified aircraft while you were at Wildenrath? Um, we sat on battle flight, which was five minute alert for, I think it was around about once every two weeks or once every 10 days. Ago. I worked it out. I think I spent three months in my three year tour. You can work it out what that was. Three months locked in a, in a hardened shelter, sat 24 hours a day at five minute notice. And in that time, we would get training scrambles, which are called tango scrambles, and then we would get alpha scrambles, which were live ones. I had a couple of alpha scrambles, but probably the the most exciting was it was a daytime sortie. Uh, we were scrambled off, and we were told that two Russian uh, Su-19 or Su-22 fitters had crossed over the border and were flying low level somewhere near the Gutterslow area. So this was very, very exciting, and I was with a, quite a, a new pilot a fairly junior pilot. So we whizzed off. I think we climbed up to you know, 10,000 feet, went across Cologne and Dusseldorf, let down into low level. And this German controller was really excited. And he was, he was screaming on the radio and he was shouting. His voice was very high pitched. You know, there are two targets and they're heading west and they're doing this. And they're both, you know, light gray and they're, 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 they're definitely SU-22 fitters and they've maybe got lost. And we were sort of thinking, you know, should we arm the aircraft? And what are they doing? And and we we were looking for about 25, 30 minutes. And eventually they said, no, no, um, port off, you can go back to base now. The, the mission's been cancelled. So I, I was, you know, really um, annoyed at the fact that, you know, I'd, I'd done my two and a half years and never seen anything Russian. And this was my one chance, but we'd missed it. But we landed. And unbeknown to us at the time, there was a thing called tactical leadership training. And that was Yeva in the north of Germany. And normally the Lightnings didn't take part in tactical leadership training because they were they were fairly antiquated by then. But uh, there were two Lightnings there, and a German Hawk um, operator, one of the, the short-range air-to-air missile guys, he'd been standing outside his cabin and seen two Lightnings whizzing over at 250 feet at 500 knots and assumed they were SU-22s. So he'd misidentified them. <laughs> so he reached back inside, called his sector controller, and said, I've just seen two Russian uh, SU-22 fitters. So we got scrambled to go and intercept these fitters, thinking that they were Russian aircraft that were lost. And actually, it was just misidented. And when we got back, we suddenly thought, so these are the guys that are actually in wartime going to be shooting at real SU-22 fitters, but they couldn't identify or they misidentify the lightning in the fitter, which is always slightly ironic to me, thinking, I wonder what was really going to happen in wartime. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. I mean, the the blood must have been really pumping, you know, with, with the feeling that you were actually going to intercept some Soviet aircraft. But I, I presume you would then ask for, as as to whether you were supposed to bring them down or just intercept them and try and get them to land yeah because they, you you would have um your mission would be to either identify or you are to engage or that you'd have shadow and shepherd which would mean you would basically sit behind it and then shepherd it and then try and force it to land at a, a good as low or a german base or a dutch base so you'd never go off on your own mm-hmm. and just you know have the freedom to go and, and fire off a missile and take down a russian su-22 you'd have to then authenticate and once you've got the the call to to identify or to engage, you would then run through a procedure 
of, and I think it was a three-letter code, where the guy would say to you, you're clear to engage and targets at flight level five, zero, heading two, 240 or whatever it was. He would then say to you, I authenticate Alpha Bravo Papa. And you'd look at the time, and if the time was 0905, you had a secret code. And if he said Alpha Bravo Papa, you had to come back with Delta Lima Echo or something. So you looked at your knee pad, and you looked at the secrets codes. So his three-letter code had to be identified and authenticated with a three-letter code by yourself. So right. there was always that, yeah. that he wasn't, you know, some guy just walked into the control room and said, yeah, you know, off you go, you can fire what you like. Or somebody the other side of the border trying to spoof the yeah. uh, air traffic control. Correct. So presumably the, these uh, codes changed on a daily basis. They did. And part of the, the handover procedure when you took over from Battleflight was you came on at 8, eight o'clock in the morning, 8.30 in the morning, and you took a great big thick wadge of secret note paper and you pulled out the page of the day, which was um, something like, you know, the 24th of October. So you ripped that sheet out, and that had your 24 hours of codes on it. Once you had ripped that page out and you'd signed for it, you then had to make sure that on the handover, you handed back the piece of paper, which is now out of date, and that went into the secret can, which was held in battle flight. And most times that weren't well, but occasionally people would put it in their pocket, go home and put their flying suit in the laundry. And then that was a major incident trying to explain, because if you lost a piece of, it was called crypto, if you lost any crypto, you couldn't just hand back some soggy pieces of paper and say to the RAF police, oh, by the way, that's my crypto. And it is, because they would say, well, you know, that could be anything. And it became a major incident. And I actually fell foul of that once coming back from an exercise in the UK. And I had to drive a car from Leeming to Broadie. And I was in charge of the crypto. And I thought, well, you know, Broadie to Leeming is going to be at least a 12-hour drive in some clapped-out old mini. And I don't really want to carry this crypto because if I've got to stop and go for, you know, a cup of coffee or something, what am I going to do with this secret paper? So I spoke to the sergeant who was in charge of the detachment um, from the Grand Crew. And he says, oh, he said, just, just take it outside, sir, and burn it. So I went, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'll just go and burn it. So I took it outside, and I burnt all these secret papers with all the codes on from the exercise. I think it was Elder Forest that we'd had. And when I got back, I um, had to hand the stuff back in and then explain everything. And I just went to the guy, the security guy, and I said, um, oh, don't worry about the crypto. I've, um, I've destroyed all that, and I've burnt it. And he said, so who witnessed it then? And I said, well, <laughs> nobody did. I did. I just burnt it. He said, well, I don't know you've done that. So I had then had this cross-examination. And they, you know when you've suddenly done something terribly, terribly wrong and you're not going to get out of it. And I just said, well, you know, I, I spoke to the NCO on the desk and he said the best thing to do is just to burn it. And I said, that's what I've done. He said, well, that's not really good enough. And there was you know, a major inquiry and questions were asked in the house, as it were, that, you know, <laughs> what had I actually done with this secret paper? <laughs> Had I really burned them? Was I a Russian agent? You know. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Was there any form of vetting to join the RAF? I mean, I've 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 never asked this question of somebody, but as to whether you had left wing sympathies or or anything like that, or or not. I, I do you know what I think in the nineteen seventeen eighties and eighties, I think they were more interested whether you had a regional accent whether you spoke with a broad Scottish accent or a, nor a northern accent, I think the days of the 70s and 80s in the Cold War, we didn't have such a diverse country that we do now. So you know, everybody came from the UK pretty much. There was the odd person that had come from somewhere abroad, but they all had a British passport and they all, you know, it was all terribly British. So there was no vetting till you until you went to a squadron which was strike-equipped or nuclear weapon-equipped, and then you had to be positive vetted. Right. But other than that, you know, nobody, nobody did background checks like they do now. Nobody, you know, we didn't have Facebook or Instagram or Twitter that anyone could sort of do a, you know, if, if you type in Paul Jones or something, somebody can find out, you know, where he went to school, who his girlfriend is, whatever you want to find out now, you can. But in those days... I mean, they said to us that when we started off in training that the first thing that we did going through Henlow and becoming an officer was that your name went into the, I think it was the London Gazette. And so in 1979, when I became a commissioned officer in February 1979, it would be pilot officer Ian Black 
uh, February 9, 1979, commissioned into the Royal Air Force as a general purposes navigator. And that apparently would go straight to um, Moscow and whoever the KGB people there on the RAS side were, they would open a file on you and anything that was ever written about you in the RAF news, in the local papers, would all go into a folder. So should I ever have been shot down and end up in, I don't know, Potsdam or somewhere, the guy would get this folder out and say, oh, I, I see your mother's in charge of the knitting club in Scarborough. <laughs> and they would then just build this file up on you. And you'd go, well, I wonder how they know that. Yeah. Because that's what they did. Critical secret information, the uh, knitting club in Scarborough. <laughs> Very. Well, that's what my father told me. My father worked with defense intelligence. So he was pretty savvy about that sort of stuff. So he said, be very careful with what you do and what you say, because one day it might come back to haunt you. Right. Right. And what, what sort of training were you given as far as interrogation and escape and evasion if you were shot down? We did a couple of courses that were uh, compulsory, should we say, that were non-voluntary, where you were left up in Otterburn or in, in somewhere in Wales, and you could never not escape being captured by the SAS. The SAS always found you somewhere, and you always end up with a, a helmet bag or hood over your head, and then stuck in some sheet pen, and then end up in some old concrete bunker with a searchlight. And it was very simple. You know, you, you were told that it was name, rank, and number. So mine would have been um, Black Flight Lieutenant 802-7202-G, and that was it. And that's all you were supposed to say. And they would brief you, and there was a, a very old black and white film about how to, it was called Resistance to Interrogation, and it showed you the good guy and the bad guy. And the good guy would always say, you know, oh, how, you know, how are you, Ian? You know, have they been treating you well? Have you, have you been having enough food? Are you warm enough? You know, have you got an electric blanket? And you go, oh, this guy's really nice. And then he eventually he would say, you know, are you missing all your, your mates on 19 Squadron? And I'd, I'd say, well, you know, not really. And he said, oh, so you are on 19 Squadron. And they would, you know, get information yeah. out of yeah. you like that. And then the other guy would be the good cop, bad cop. And, you know, the bad guy would just slap you around the head and say, you know, which squadron are you on? And just beat you to death. Um, so you knew what was coming. Yeah. What sort of lengths did they go to to give you a, an idea of how stressful that that would be i mean presumably they didn't physically harm you uh yes they did <laughs> yeah i mean they, they did you know they did physically harm you we had uh people when i went through training who would get a pistol with blanks in they'd fire blanks next to you or they'd fire two blanks knowing they had two bullets and then put one to the side of your head and then click the trigger you know it was that serious it was you know you you were pushed against walls. I was pushed against a tree once with a bag on my head, smacked into a tree, um, roughed up a bit. You know, it's, it, it wasn't um, PC, that's for sure. No. You know, I, I mean, guys I know were put underneath waterfalls for, you know, two hours at a time in the middle of Wales, um, told to strip off completely naked in front of female interrogation officers. It was, um, yeah, I mean, but the other, you know, on the other hand, you know, it was, it was realistic training, I suppose. You yeah. know, there's no point putting somebody in a an air conditioned room in the middle of summer and saying, you know, you warm enough, you are cold enough, can turn the heat down a bit, because clearly, you know, if you got caught by the Soviet Union and you just dropped your nuclear weapon from a buccaneer and wiped out two thousand people in the village, they were not going to be nice to you. That was for sure. No, no, that that's really interesting. So after three years flying uh, backseat in a in a phantom you you go into pilot training but i i've read that in in your words mathematics wasn't your your strongest subject and um there was some criticism of your flying skills i i was well aware that i i passed o level maths with the bare minimum and it required the maximum effort to get that that result so mental gymnastics are uh, were not my forte but I discovered that when I was 20, that the reason it wasn't my forte was because I just basically at school, I couldn't be bothered. Now, and I realized if you wanted to achieve something in the end and sat down and learned it and applied yourself, then you could pretty much do anything. So I, I just knew that I had to, to get around that task and sat down and then got, and got around it. And so that was a two-year course, I think, 84 to 86. Yep. So I did 
all of them, maybe 18 months on the Jet Provost and then went to the Hawk at Bally and then went to the Hawk at Broadie. And as you have alluded to there, you know, my flying skills, that all my pilots I flew with on the Phantom, they all said to me, you know, when you go to um, become a pilot, you know, you'll just walk it, you'll just be an absolute breeze. And I thought, oh, this is going to be quite good fun. You know, I'll just, I'll just go and get an aircraft and start it up and off I go. But, you know, nothing could be further from the truth because even though I had a huge head start with 750 hours flying a Phantom at 450 miles an hour, even going to a jet provost at 180 miles an hour, all of a sudden when you put your hand on the stick and you put your other hand on the throttle and you have to talk at the same time, it's a completely different ball game to sitting in the back of an aircraft and not having to worry about the aircraft flying and just looking out about you know where the navigation is going. So I did find it initially um, pretty a pretty steep learning curve. And I, I knew as well that there was a lot of um, people assuming that I was going to ace the whole course and I didn't want to let anybody down, especially my father. Um, and just the fact I'd gone from becoming a navigator to a pilot, you know, that was a very rare occurrence. And I didn't want to let anybody down thinking, well, because if, I, if I'd failed it, they'd just go, well, we're never going to do that again. Yeah. Yeah, and I get, yeah, I can imagine how tough it would have been with what with the success of your 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 father as well looming there in the background. Yeah, and everybody I met, you know, when they said what's your name and I said Black and they said are you George Black's son? And then it was either, you know, have I met somebody that's been chopped by my father or, or come across my father in a bad way or in a good way? You know, my father had a fairly fearsome reputation as being a and a very efficient leader and, a, and a, a, a skilled fighter pilot, but he didn't pull any punches on anybody. He didn't take any prisoners. So, you know, I had to be slightly careful about when people said, are you George Black's son? I would go, yes, but I never went, why? Because I didn't want to know, really. And I knew that I had to make my own way in the RAF, and I had to, you know, set my own mark, as it were. I couldn't rely on my father's previous abilities and, and his skills you know i had to make my you know had to be my own man really yeah yeah and at the end of your training you're selected for an air defense role flying the english electric lightning which from what i understand is not the easiest plane to fly so you you must have had you know you must have really built up your your ability during that period well, as I said, when I first started, I, I did find it very difficult. Uh, I, I'm probably exaggerating. And I, you know, when I say very difficult, I found it was a difficult course. And I definitely didn't say to myself, you know, I'm a natural pilot. And there were certain things which, you know, I got, I got there in the end, I suppose. And, and certain things that people said to me, maybe after six months of flying, that suddenly the penny dropped and, you know, like just just look out the window, you know, rather than looking at instruments and trying to make all the instruments stop and freeze, just look out the window, look at the horizon, and it'll do, it'll do the same thing and, and set a certain power and set a certain attitude. And all those things probably people said to me in the first couple of weeks, but it didn't sink in because I was so busy at um, just trying to stay straight and level. And the other thing was that, you know, in the early days, there was so much to take in, just trying to taxi an airplane or start the airplane. And all the checks had to be done 110% correct. You know, you couldn't say DME to on and pulsing. It had to be DME, it had to be on, pulsing, and, and the correct strength. You know, it had to be word perfect. And if you didn't do it word perfect, you were back to square one. And they were they were relentless in making sure that you got everything you know, done correctly. So the only way that I um, started to excel, perhaps maybe, was when it came to navigation. And not only had I flown around the UK um, a fair bit, but I just, you know, when you fly at 450 knots or 420 knots, and you're doing seven miles a minute. If you're suddenly doing 180 knots, and you're doing three miles a minute, then <laughs> your brain is working five times as fast as the other students. So I didn't have to worry about getting lost or, you know, if I knew that I was a mile off track, I could get myself back on track. If I knew if I was 30 seconds late for a target, I could get myself on time on target. And it, it almost caught me out once when I did a, <clears throat> I did a standards check with a, a guy from, uh, I think it would have been Scampton. He was a QFI. And every now and again, <clears throat> they rocked up with like a, a mystery shopper come no notice. Uh, we're going to just check out a student and, and see how our instructors are doing. And it was a, really a test of the instructors, really, to see how they were teaching um, students. And I went off with this guy, and I think he'd flown Balkans. 
and without being disparaging. So he wasn't um, he wasn't a fast jet pilot, and I'll say that uh, rather than being disparaging. And we went off to I think it was somewhere north of um, Barnard Castle, and we he gave me a target which was something like a a bridge with a telephone box to the right of it. And as we got to towards Barnard Castle. The weather got worse and worse and worse, and it was the limit was five kilometres visibility in a thousand foot from cloud, and I knew that it was about I don't know four and a half k vis. It was right on the limit, but I thought, well, I'll just impress this guy and show that I can actually get this target and I can get it on time. And the visibility got worse and worse and worse, and even I was working quite hard. And eventually, I said, right, you know, here's the mast. This is what we're going to leave the mast on heading, whatever it was, uh, three two zero, and uh, hit my stopwatch, set the right speed. And I just talked my way through this IP target run. And there we found this little tiny telephone box in the middle of a moor somewhere. And we were plus or minus two seconds, I think. And I could see that he was he was obviously very impressed with my navigational skills, but he wasn't impressed with the fact that I'd been bumbling around at uh, low level at four and a half K viz. So in the debrief, he said to me, look, you know, I know that you clearly you can navigate your way out of a paper bag, but he said, you know, you've only got, 80 hours on the aeroplane and just be careful with what you're doing. So I had to be um, very aware that there were certain things that I could do well, but certain things that I was like instrument flying where I was just, you know, no better than anybody else. So I had to temper it between the two and never forget that I was only a baby pilot. I wasn't, a, you know, an experienced pilot. I want to highlight our friends at the Cold War channel on YouTube. I've been watching their quality videos for some time and I highly recommend them. The videos are presented in an easily digestible format and cover some fascinating and sometimes little known Cold War subjects. From the Kishtim disaster, the biggest nuclear disaster before Chernobyl, to the anti-Soviet guerrilla war in the Baltics. The episodes on Cold War TV provide a fantastic insight into areas of the Cold War not covered elsewhere. Just search for Cold War TV on YouTube. And now, back to our episode. So, 25 years after your father had been one of the first Lightning pilots, you become the last RAF pilot to be trained on the Lightning. How, how did that feel? Well, I guess I was elated uh, on the one side, but then extremely apprehensive on the other side because, as I said to you, I was I always had that, and I wish somebody never told me that that phrase, the imposter syndrome, uh, a couple of weeks ago, because I'd always had that self doubt. I think it is that you know, was I um, living beyond my means, as it were? Was I doing something that I wasn't capable of doing? And I think at the time there was. Um, the Harrier, the Jaguar, and the Lightning were the three single-seat aircraft. The Harrier obviously was the you know the most difficult aircraft to operate as a single-seat pilot, and it was low-level ground attack. But the Lightning was equally difficult in the fact that it was a reasonably difficult airplane to operate or fly, but incredibly difficult to operate as a weapon system. So I was under no illusion that. Um, you know, going to Bimbrook and flying the Lightning was not going to be easy at all, and I would be, uh, I suppose, at the at the absolute extreme of my capacity and ability to try and get through the course. I think you you describe the the Lightning as being superbly responsive, advanced, unique, and overwhelmingly overpowered aircraft. You also talk about the level of concentration, attention, and respect that it requires. It sounds like it was a it's a beautiful looking aircraft, but it sounds like it was one that you really had to keep an eye on when you were flying it. If you ever flew a jet Provis, when you let the brakes off a jet Provis, you had to put a whole load of power on to get it to move. And then, as somebody once said to me, um, going back to my jet Provis days, that the jet Provis was the only aircraft that when the designers built it, they put the pointed end at the back and the blunt end at the front. <laughs> and it was just so underpowered. The Lightning... At idle power had more thrust on the ground than a jet propulsor at full power, so it was incredibly overpowered. Um, but it was superbly designed, um, and I think Roland Beaumont takes a lot of the credit for this in terms of 
it's probably the ultimate aircraft in terms of the sort of the man and machine interface. So you really do, and I know it's a bit of a cliche, you slap one on your back, and then once you're on the on, on, in the seat, once you're in the seat and you've got the thing going and started up and flying, you really do feel as though you are almost moulded into that cockpit and you are part of that aircraft. So when you put more power on, you know, people say, you know, the seat of the pants like flying, you put more power on, you push your, your throttles forward, you just get this surge in the back of your, the small of your back. At the same time, you can feel through the intake, you can feel a huge rush of air, and you audibly as well, you can feel this air coming under your feet, going into the engines, being span around, having a whole lot of kerosene thrown at it, ignited, and then pushed out the back. And so you have this wonderful sensation that not only are you flying an aircraft, but you're actually part of that aircraft. You know, when people say that engines are the part of an aircraft and the pilot the soul, you you really are part of an aircraft, and, and you can make it sing and dance, but you can also you know get completely overwhelmed by it. You are only limited by the amount of fuel you could have in it, really. You know, so if you if you selected full reheat. It would just keep going and going and going and climbing, climbing, climbing. It wouldn't. It wouldn't stop. And it didn't sort of. In a tornado, you would just run out of air and thrust. Um, in the lightning, you never did. And I guess that's a testament to the the designers. They it was gloriously overpowered, and yet gloriously overcomplicated as well. It was it, at the time it was built in the mid fifties. I, I think it was an amalgamation of the height of engine technology, the height of sweat wing design, the height of intake technology, the height of radar performance, and trying to put that all wrapped under some aluminium under under the fuselage and get it to all work and then start wrapping fuel pipes and hydraulic pipes and electrics around it. It was just at the, at the pinnacle of that sort of era of aviation uh, technology, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and what what sort of uh, operating range did the Lightning have? I guess obviously it depends on you know how much uh, power you're you're applying. Well, the the early Lightnings um, were quite aerodynamic in terms of didn't have many scoops and vents and stuff down it, so they were quite slippery. Um, the middle range of Lightnings are Mark Threes. You could probably get thirty to forty minutes out of those if you didn't use any reheat. The later marks of Lightnings, you get an hour and ten minutes out of them. And, and I think the, you know, people um, often malign the Lightning in that it never had any fuel. I mean, the later Lightnings did have a lot of fuel, but, you know, you could burn through that because you had two engines for a start and they were firstly engines. So you could easily get through that fuel in, I think, in one of the mid- middle range Lightnings of Mark III. I could remember a sortie where in, in seven minutes I'd, I'd gone from full fuel to minimum fuel. <laughs> wow. Wow, but you know when when you joined, um, you know the the Lightning Squadron, it was the tail end of its career with the RAF. I think it they it was became non operational in eighty eight. Was it April eighty eight was when it was down declared, and eventually the last Lightning was ended in about June eighty eight. I think. Right, right. And wh- where were you stationed with the Lightning? Was it UK or Germany again? Uh, so I was stationed in. Uh, Bimbrook in Lincolnshire, and the Germany Lightnings had finished in 76, 77, so they'd been gone for a good 10 years. And, and the Lightning era, you know, there's there's different types of Lightning pilot. There's guys from the 60s, there's guys from the 70s, and then guys from the 80s. And what we did in the 80s was very different to the, what the guys did in the 70s, and I'm not derising what they did because they did a lot of, you know, high-level intercepts and, and high-speed intercepts, and we did more low-level intercepts over the sea, and a lot more visual intercepts uh, later on in, in, in its career, whereas the Germany guys did a lot of low-level over land uh, intercepts, which we didn't tend to do in the UK much. So depending who uh, you speak to, you know, you need to say to them, well, where, where did you fly the lightning? Because depending where they flew it in Singapore or Cyprus or Germany or in the UK depends really what sort of role they did and how they operated the aircraft. Yeah. Yeah, and you you were on QRA. So was that similar to uh, the the Phantom? You're sitting in a hardened shelter for 24 hours. No, not at all. It was um, the UK QRA had QRA at Lucas, which was Northern QRA, QRA at Bimbrook, which was Southern, and the QRA at Coningsby, 
uh, which had no shelter at all, uh, and then QRA at Watersham, which is a southern QRA. And we would just have the two aircraft sat in a, in a metal hangar, uh, only designed for two aircraft, and then we'd have the ground crew, uh, probably about five or six, and then two pilots sat next to the aircraft. And you would do the same as in Germany, do eight in the morning to eight in the morning the following day, 24 hours. And was that you were on five minutes standby, or, or was it so? Um, it's a very good, a very good question, Ian. I, I think we're actually we're on ten minutes in the UK, but five minutes in Germany, ten minutes in the UK, because in the UK you'd get far more notice of what was coming around the the, you know, the Iceland Faroes Gap, and it would be, you know, there's a couple of bears that's taken off now, and they get intelligence of what's going on. Whereas in Germany, it would be something going over the, the East German border or something, and that would be, you know, get airborne now. But the lightning could be airborne in two and a half minutes quite easily. It didn't need 10 minutes, mainly because the lightning didn't have an inertial navigation system. And that was what the the problem with the Phantom was. So that took something like five minutes to warm up and, and get aligned, whereas the lightning, all you had to do was lift the gang bar, put the petrol on, put the electrics on, press the start buttons, and that was it. You're off. You know, there was... Nothing to warm up, really. In the radar, you could turn on once you got airborne. Yeah, you make that sound very straightforward. I'm sure it was. <laughs> no, it's pretty much like that. Yeah. No, <laughs> it was. Well, well, what you did was you um, you did a thing. You cocked the aircraft. So when you came onto QRA at o'clock in the morning, you met the other guy, and he would say to you, "And uh, you're taking over Bravo Foxtrot or something. Uh, it's got these following snags. You know, the the tack end doesn't work." The radar's limited to 40 miles or something, or what? You know, it's got a leak on this side. He'd tell you a few things about it. And then you'd go out to the aircraft, and in the um, QRA shelter, you walked around the aircraft, checked for any unusual leaks or any dents or anything that wasn't in the, the technical log. And then you got into the cockpit, and then you lengthened the straps to be your correct size. And then you put the cockpit in an eye pleasing manner. So you would go from left to right set the radar up the way you wanted it and then leave the throttles off and then put all the switches exactly how you want it. So you set the Q&H or the QFE or whatever it was. You set the gun sight to however you wanted to be set, make sure the fuel um, was in the correct place. And, you know, so just when you jumped up into the ladder, up the ladder into the cockpit and sat down, you had to do was do your straps, uh, pull the pins out, give the pins to the ground crew and then pull the gang bar up and start the engine and off you went. It was all, and that's why it's still cocked. It was ready to go. Yeah. And so the the Lightning was still armed with cannons. So you, you potentially really up close with uh, whoever you were going to uh, tangle with. We, we we flew with cannon and we also flew with um, two missiles as well. So either Fire Stick or Red Top. And I can't remember the Aiden cannon, which I think is 30 millimeter. I think they used to load some tracer in that as well. So at night time, if you um, wanted to give some guy a warning shot, you could just fire up at a tracer, and then that would give off a bit of a flash, I guess. Right. And so, how did how did you practice with with that? Did you practice on on targets or anything like that with the cannon? Uh, well, we would go to Cyprus once a year and do air to air gunnery, and again, it was a very um, strange um, training that we did in the air force. So. We didn't tend to do gunnery like other air forces do, you know, once a month or something. We'd go out there to do an intensive six weeks or four weeks of gunnery, and then we'd come back and forget about it. And air-to-air gunnery requires a huge amount of skill and a a definite um, set of skill techniques that require you to, uh, how can I describe it? So there's so many things involved with air-to-air gunnery that you don't think about, especially in an aircraft like the Lightning where you don't have um, head-up display. So you've got to really understand how when you squeeze the trigger and bullets start coming out the front of the cannon, things like gravity drop, um, lead, lead for target motion, uh, angle off, all that sort of stuff. So when you put your um, your pipper on the back of a target, you've got to know what the, the wingspan of the aircraft is so, so you can work out how the range of the target is but then you've got to pull enough lead so you know that when you squeeze the trigger and the bullets go off, they're not going to fly off the back of the target. They're going to go either on the front of it and then drop onto the target or actually bury them into the target um, behind the cockpit. So we did that for a month, and all of a sudden you became quite proficient and quite skilled in air-to-air gunnery. Then you go back to the UK, and all you do would be missile firing again. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, that's that, that's that's interesting. Um, what was your most memorable interception of a Soviet Warsaw Pact aircraft on QRA? Um, I guess my first intercept of a, a Russian bomber is always, you know, not just me, anybody, any pilot or navigator who did it, is always your most exciting because it's taken you, it took me longer than most people, but it, it, it's always going to take you three, three and a half years before you're going to get in a position where you know, you're going to be launched off QRA and told, you know, you have a zombie, an unknown target, bearing 060, 240 miles at flight level, you know, angels, 340. So, you know, when you finally get to do that, that's what you've been training for for three and a half years. That's what you've done all those jet provost flights for. That's what you've done all those Hawk flights, all those aerobatic flights, all that stuff at Gordy doing, you know, dropping bombs on ranges. It's all been effectively, you know, geared to intercept that Russian bomber. And it's the same, you know, it's not just me in that lightning. It's all the people on that airbase, you know, the, the guy who's the Bowser driver who refuels the lightning. His whole job is to make sure that you're full of fuel. You know, the guy who changes the engine, the guy who works in the cookhouse who brings your meals, you know, everybody is, you know, working to get to that one final thing of getting a lightning, a phantom, a typhoon, a tornado, whatever, is alongside that Russian bomber um, to show him that, you know, we're capable of doing that. And that's why I think your first intercept is always the one you remember. And my first intercept of the Russian bomber, um, was uh, I think it was in the middle of summer and we'd been scrambled and the guy was saying to us yes he's you know heading whatever it was and I could work out from the gymnastics of the, the geometry that this guy was you know going away from us and I thought this is going to be it you know it's going to be my one chance of seeing a Russian bomber and I'm, I'm going to miss it so I pretended not to hear him and he kept saying you know you've got to turn back you've got to turn away I could see where it was it was about 60 miles away so we just carried on and coming alongside this big silver Russian bomber was sort of a, a life-defining moment, I suppose, of being a sort of um, when your whole world goes into widescreen and you suddenly go, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm alongside a guy. I've got no idea what language he speaks or where he's from, what base he's from, but he's flying around in UK airspace and he's got a great big you know, silver metal Russian bomber and there's that great big red star paint on the tail and you know, I want to go and look at him and take photographs on them and, and finally sort of show to him that you know, my three and a half years of training have not been um, wasted. Yeah. Yeah. And did any of the the air crew of the Soviet aircraft try and interact with you or make gestures or anything like that? <laughs> um, there were, you know, I'd, I'd seen obviously lots of photographs of guys flicking V signs and holding copies of Playboy up and Coca-Cola bottles and stuff like that, which was, you know, the legends that were that went before me, and they were they were obviously all true. And the only time that I had a bit of interaction was um, intercepting a Russian Bear Foxtrot, which is a, an anti-submarine warfare aircraft. And we knew what it was because it had a big um, boom on the back of the tail. And as we were on the left hand side of it, we could see that its bomb doors opened. So I was in a tornado at this time, and my backseat said, oh, we should go and have a look and see what we can see what's inside the bomb bay. And stupidly, I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, get your camera out and let's have a look in the bomb bay and see if we can take some photographs of the intelligence people. So I positioned my aircraft underneath the bomb bay, thinking that I was being very clever and very savvy. And as I got right underneath it, a sonar boy came out with a little flare on it and a parachute. And I thought that was a pretty stupid thing to do because had that hit us, then it would have been a very um, difficult thing to try and explain. And I wonder whether the guy knew what we were doing and he opened the bomb bay deliberately so that we'd go under there and maybe just see if we'd actually take a photograph. And then he just said, oh, I'll, just, I'll drop a sonar boy now and see what see what he does. So. Wow. Well, I did interview a, a Phantom pilot a couple of years ago, I think it was, and he told me about an incident similar to that where the sonar boy got wrapped around the tail and they tried to bring it back, but it, it fell off some way over the North Sea. No, I didn't, I didn't get that close. I was um, <laughs> I was foolish, but not stupid. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really interesting. Now, obviously, being out in the North Sea, you're, you, you would normally have to do air-to-air refueling. And you posted some great photos on your on your Twitter feed of refueling with the um, Victor 
uh, tankers. Yep. Can you just take me through that that refueling process and the the challenges that you you face trying to do that? Well, in in the sort of late eighties, um, the air force seemed to be awash with tankers of Victors and VC tens, and we had Balkans occasionally, and even the Buccaneers would be tankers and. We had designated areas in the North Sea which were tow lines, and I can't remember the number, I think it was tow line five or tow line four or something. So we knew where they were. Um, and in the morning, we would get told that you know there would be a VC-10 on tow line four between 11 o'clock and 11.45, and we had a 20-minute slot for two lightnings, and they would allocate whatever the flying program was that these two guys would go off and go to the tanker between 11 and 11.20, and that was how we worked it out. And they would then also say to you, that you've got, I can't remember what the figures were, but you know, 8,000 or 12,000 pounds of giveaway. So you could say, well, you know, if we go to the tanker first, that would mean we'd be filled to full. So there's a bit of gymnastics trying to work out, um, you know, mental arithmetic of thinking, well, ha- do we want to go to the tanker before we've done our mission? Or do you want to go after? Or do you want to go to the tanker straight away to fill to full, then go and do our mission? And then we'd probably be working with, you know, tornadoes or buccaneers or something. And then, trying to coordinate with them as well so that we didn't all arrive at the tank at the same time. Um, and one of the sort of, I, I guess, the, um, how would I describe it, <clears throat> the sort of the big match um, moments is if you're a young pilot and you're fairly inexperienced, if you're leading maybe two or three lightnings, so you've got four lightnings, that you've got to take four lightnings to the tanker. So they're all relying on you to coordinate getting them to the tanker. So once you've done whatever you're going to do and you decide to go to the tanker, you've got to get them into some sort of formation where they're going to sit alongside you, either in a loose formation or a close formation, and then you've got to look at your radar, find where the tanker is, and then get them to the tanker um, in a in a controlled manner, should we say. Mm. And that's sort of probably where most air defense debriefs take so long because um, if you're sitting on a guy's wing who's leading you to the tanker, the last thing you want to do is have some bloke suddenly find the tanker, I don't know, five miles and 80 degrees off your nose, and he all of a sudden goes into a 5G turn and full reheat, and you know, you've got three other aircraft who are trying to you know, tag around with you to get behind this tanker. So you've got to make it a very coordinated and smooth and controlled join. So when you look at the tanker, he's going around in this racetrack pattern, you're trying to anticipate that um, as he's, so so, so you're heading north and he's heading south, you want to anticipate so that as he starts his turn, he wants to be turning, say, 10 miles ahead of you so that when he rolls out and you're heading north and he rolls out heading north, you're going to be two miles behind and you're going to be doing, say, 350 knots and he's doing 300 knots and you've got 50 knots of closure and then you can just gently close in behind them. And all receivers, as they were, they, you all work to a standard operating procedure. So from memory, I think it was you join on the left, and so all four of you would join on the left. You let the tanker see that you're there. Once he sees you're there, he will. if he hasn't got any other people there, he will deploy his um, refueling hoses. And then if you, you can use silent procedures, you're then clear to join behind the tanker. So the first two of you go, to the right, to the left, you then fill the full, and then the other two, um, they take their turn as well. And then once you've filled up, you then depart the tanker in a controlled fashion. Right. So it's, it was it was a fairly um, nerve wracking uh, experience or thing to do when you were a young pilot because you normally had, if you were number one and you had number two, three, and four, numbers three and four or two and three would normally be very experienced pilots and they were watching you like a hawk. So any mistakes you made, you know, they would be very critical of you in the debrief because you know, you could have been doing it at night, you could have been doing it in cloud. So doing it in the day, on a clear day when you can see the tanker from twenty five miles away, it's pretty easy. But doing it in cloud with three other aircraft trying to join the tanker is is very difficult. I'm always incredulous as to how you know how how that is done and how you know, you you manage to get the aircraft to, you know, get attached to the hose. Um, and I understand there's a traffic light system or something on the, certainly on the Victor, wasn't there? There was. There was um, from memory. There was a green, amber, and red. And I think green meant you were clear to make contact. And once you'd um, put the probe into the basket, the probe, I think it went amber, 
and that meant fuel flowed. And if you pushed the, the hose too far back into the basket, it then went red and then you had to back off. Right. And so were you locked to the tanker then or not? It's a metal probe, but it's got like a couple of little tiny hooks which are on springs. And they have like a pressure um, point on them. So you push into the into the basket and the, the, the points then move out with a spring and they're locked uh, under a certain pressure. And then if you back off on the power, then that will disconnect you. So it's not locked as in locked. Right. It's just like a... Um, so you've got to maintain your speed in order to keep that seal. But as soon as you decelerate, it would the the seal would break and the fuel would stop flowing as well correct and on on the on the hose there are markings on the hose so you can push the hose in and then you just hold that position by looking at where the marks on the hose are so you know how far in and out you are and then if you come too far back then the fuel will stop flowing okay okay wow once once you're in it's actually reasonably reasonably simple it's, it's getting in, and the, the lightning was particularly difficult because, of course, the probe was um, on your left shoulder, so you couldn't see the probe. So you had to use the, the standby compass in the lightning and put that onto the rubber hose of the Victor or the VC10 or whatever it was, and fly that up the hose in the hope that by flying that up the hose, then your probe tip would go into the basket. At the same time, you had to make sure that you didn't have too much overtake on. So if the Victor was doing 300 knots, you didn't want to be doing more than about 305 knots because if you hit the basket doing 310 knots, then that would put what's called the brake on and then the brake would suddenly stop it and then then you wouldn't be able to take fuel. Or worst case, if you did 315 knots and the tip of your probe hit the side of the basket, it would go through the basket and damage the basket. And then you, not not in a lightning because the probe was further back, but on on a tornado, for example, if you hit the basket and the little um, little feathers that were on there, if you hit it too hard and then one of those broke off, that could easily go down your intake and damage your engine. Right. Wow. Wow. Now, um, I, I also understand you you flew you flew one of the uh, last lightning detachments to uh, Guttersloe in in January eighty eight. What was what was that like? Because that's effectively the the sunset on on the lightning, wasn't it? In the uh, RAF, it, it was, and it was winter time, unfortunately. Uh, so the weather wasn't great. Um, and I'd always wanted I uh, I taken the lightning to Wildenrath for an air show uh, in the September with um, one of the other lightning pilots as a static. But we spent I think it was two weeks or ten days at Goodersloe fighting against the Harris. And that was sort of, um, you know, the, to me, one of the icings on the cake, because having been a young boy and been to Goodersloe with my father, uh, he wasn't actually there, uh, based there, but he, he'd been to see friends and watching green lightnings flying around their level and doing low-level intercepts over the North German plains and the Osbrook Bridge. To go and actually do that for real was um, pretty good. That uh, was probably one of the best parts of my tour, I think. Yeah, I think it's it's amazing with the, with the 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 lightning where you know you you were flying it as a well there there were two two seat lightnings but effectively you're you're flying a a single seat lightning where you've got to fly that aircraft and also do the navigation at the same time. Cool. That's why, as I said to you earlier, uh, you know my experience of being in the back of a Phantom stood me in good stead because a lot of the times you're you're doing intercepts where you'll sit on a combat air patrol. Um, going back to Goodersloe. So you'd be sitting on the Osnabrück Ridge doing a combat air patrol on a heading of east and a heading of west. So you'd be going east for two minutes and you'd do a cross turn with two aircraft. Then you'd head back west and then you'd turn back east again looking for the targets. So you, you, know, you have this air picture in your head that I'm heading east, I'm heading east. And then all of a sudden somebody says, you know, I've got a contact um, 20 right of the nose at four or five miles. It's, a, it's an F-104 or something or it's um, a Phantom or an F-15. So then you, you start chasing after it, and then your your head is sort of going, right, I'm now heading um, 060, I'm now doing 550 knots, I'm now doing 600 knots, I'm doing 10 miles a minute. And then you're trying to think, how long have I been going away from cap now? So my cap position was you know, 10 miles behind me, but now I've been doing two minutes of chasing this F-15, and then he might start accelerating, he might suddenly do 550 knots, and he might start running south. So you're going, right, okay, I've gone south for a minute and I went east for two minutes and I went west for three minutes. You know, um, and then let me look at your fuel, how far am I away from Goodersloe? 
you know, what if I hit a bird now? Where am I going to go to? All the time you're thinking about, you know, what fuel you've got left, where can you get to? Or, you know, but we did pre, we pre-briefed uh, what was called bingo fuel, so and a joker fuel. So you, you, in the lightning, when you hit 2200 the side, I think it was, that was your bingo one, and then maybe 18 was bingo two. And then the joker fuel meant that I think you had enough to do one more intercept and then go home. Right. So you knew that if you hit, say, I don't know, 1,400 pounds a side, wherever you were, you need to be heading home. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Now, I, I read that you flew a MiG twenty nine. How how did that come about? Um, I it's, it's too long for a podcast, but I, <laughs> I managed to get myself a month of work in Malaysia, uh, teaching the Royal Malaysian Air Force Air Combat in the Hawk two hundred. Uh, only about ten years ago, maybe maybe fifteen, maybe ten years ago, and. Um, Part of the deal was that myself and a German Air Force F-4 pilot who had um, also flown the MiG, he was teaching the MiG pilots on, I think it was actually 19 squad in the Malaysian Air Force. So we were teaching them MiGs and the Hawks air combat techniques and various sort of Western NATO techniques. And at one point in the course, myself, um, uh, the German guy and the Malaysian said, well, let's swap over roles. So you fly in the back of a MiG and the German guy can go back in, in the back of a Hawk. So I got to ride in the back of the MiG, which was very similar to a Lightning, very sort of basic, but absolutely brutal in terms of its performance. You know, very, you know, when you compare it to an F-16 that seems to put on 9G, but in a gentlemanly fashion, you know, the, the MiG-29 just gives you 9G in an instant. You know, it's absolutely uh, brutal is the best word for it, I think. Right. Um and what aircraft would you have liked to fly but never got the opportunity to? I always wanted to fly the F-104, um, not because I think it was a great aeroplane or great to fly, but I would just love to have got into the back or front of an F-104 and seen what it was actually like because it seemed to me uh, even more dangerous or difficult to fly in the Lightning. Um, I would have loved to have flown an F-14 probably in the back seat, not in the front seat, onto a carrier and seeing what a, a carrier ride is like or an F-4 onto a carrier would have been good. Um, in terms of aircraft, I'd have loved to have flown. I think the Ferry Delta II would have been the icing on the cake of, of, of the pilot to get strapped into one of those things with the droop's nose and, and going off and what Peter twisted, you know, a thousand miles an hour faster than the sun. Totally, you know, the right stuff would have been... Um, would have been a good thing to fly. Yeah, yeah. Now, through through our chat, Ian, we I've spoken about your amazing photos, and I really recommend uh, listeners follow Ian's Twitter account, which has regular regular tales of his of his flying career, but also some brilliant photos. And a lot of these photos are are published in Fire Streak. Books, Ian. Tell me about Fire Street Books. Well, when I was in the Air Force, I always because my father had been in the Air Force from sort of fifty to nineteen eighty eight. He was always very pro PR, um, recording history, making sure the things that that you know, like when he flew over Winston Churchill's uh, funeral and the lightning, you know, that the photographs were taken and photographs were kept in the moment they recorded for history and. I suppose when I was on the Lightning, that's when it really came to fruition, was that I knew that I was at the end of an era. You know, I knew that there would never be an aeroplane like the Lightning again. I knew that there would never be pilots like there the were in the Lightning. So I wanted to to capture that moment, for, not for posterity, not for me, but for other people that, you know, like now, 40 years later, can look back and go, wow, that's what we did. And it's so different from a typhoon. And I wanted to put... Um, people who were enthusiastic about aircraft into the cockpit so they knew what it was like to be. You know, I, I didn't want to take photographs that were just dim, clear, blue days. I wanted to take photographs, as you said, you know, going up a, alongside a bear bomber. I wanted to take pictures on the tanker. I wanted to take pictures at night or at dusk to show people at low level what we did. And I'd had um, publishing contracts to do before, but I always felt that Publishers produced a book, and then after a couple of months, there was another book came out, and they moved on. And I think the medium of photography and aviation photography 
deserves to be in that sort of coffee book style publication. And so I, I hummed and hard with a, a title and I came up with Fire Street because that was the missile and lightning. And when I Googled it, nobody else had Fire Street as a word um, in, in, a, in a web domain. So Fire Street Books became um, my sort of title for the books. And I wanted to make coffee table books so that people could see you know, a, a decent sized picture of a lightning refueling and not not have to read loads and loads of words. The, the picture spoke for itself, really, and that, that's how it all came around. Twitter is very good, and, I, and because I'm in, in advancing years, I find it quite hard to to deal with Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that sort of social media. And you know, much as I like Twitter, I like the fact that Twitter you can interact with people. So if I put a picture of a VC10 up there, somebody will say, "Oh, I worked on those. You know, that was 10 years of my life, or my dad worked on them. I lived at Five Norton." And then they can ask you a question, and you can answer the question. They say, "What was it like? You know, was there a difference between refueling a Victor or VC10?" And you can give them an answer. But I find that Instagram is is probably better for um, recording your work, and so that's why my Instagram Fire Street books I put more of a story. So I'll put a picture, say I put one this morning or yesterday morning of a Jaguar, um, and I'll put a little story about how I took the photograph and what camera I use sometimes or what lens or something that went wrong or something that went right um just to give the people a bit more feel it's not just this is a picture you know, they they then go or oh, this is a picture taken on an exercise and this aircraft later crashed or whatever i don't know what it would be but it, it just gives them a bit more history behind the image yeah yeah and that 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 works really well i mean i've i'm regularly retweeting uh Ian's tweets there, but the Instagram account is worth a look as well, as well as the website. And there'll be links to each of those in the uh, show notes, and there'll be details of how to access those show notes at, at the end of the episode. If, if people want to know, I mean, I did the color series books for Fire Street Books, and they, they would prove very, very popular. And the Lightning seems to be the spitfire of its generation. There people. I'm amazed at how many people went to Nature at Biggin Hill when they were five years old and saw a lightning and they're now 55 years old and they go, that still, you know, resonates in my head. And then I did a book um, called Black Leader, which is my father's book. Um, and that was very interesting as well to do. And I've always had a hankering to do my own biography. So I, I do plan to do one on learning to fly the lightning, one on flying the lightning on the spot, and then cover each of the types I flew so they the phantom which i probably call from back to front and then i'll do one on the tornado and then one on the past 2000 so i've got plenty to keep me going um and i'm always inspired as well by the people who seem to like what i do and i'm quite humbled by it and they like my photographs and they like asking questions and, and i do like that interaction between people so that you know they can actually speak to the author or the person who's done the book and we have further information such as videos and links in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. These are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Frederick Esposito, Jeffrey Jones, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.